What's fact and what's fiction? A leading lung cancer expert will tackle common questions and misconceptions so you can make sound decisions about your care. Fact or fiction? Lung cancer. Brought to you by the Patient Empowerment Network. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to Fact or Fiction, lung cancer symptoms, side effects, and treatment. Today, we'll debunk common misconceptions about lung cancer symptoms, side effects, and treatment. I'm Patricia Murphy, your host for today. Joining us is Dr. Martin Edelman. Dr. Edelman, why don't you introduce yourself? So uh, I'm a medical oncologist. I'm the chair of the Department of Hematology, Oncology, and Deputy De Director for uh, Clinical Research at the Fox Chase uh, Cancer Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And before we get started, we should say this program is not a substitute for medical advice. Please refer to your healthcare team with any questions. Let's start with an overview of lung cancer's research. Can you tell us a little bit about the field right now? So I think the field has been remarkable the last uh, few years. Uh, there's been more progress, more drugs, uh, more things that have happened. Uh, in the last five years than probably the prior 50. Um, it's been a, an amazing time, uh, both for developments in the molecular biology as well as in immunotherapy uh, of the disease, um, which is exciting for you know, all concerned. Uh, you know, for patients, of course, you know, uh, really a promise of uh, uh, longer, better lives, uh, even cures where we previously did not see any um, with advanced disease. Uh, for, you know, the scientists, uh, an amazing amount of new information and uh, for clinicians and clinical investigators, uh, uh, just, you know, almost too many questions for us to answer. It sounds like the field is really advancing quickly. What do you attribute that to? Well, you know, I think there are a number of things, you know, everybody always talks about breakthroughs, but, but breakthroughs really happen after, you know, decades of, of other work, you know, and, you know, what's happening now is really a result of, of many, many years of, of different types of work. You know, there were uh, our colleagues in immunology who built this area of cancer immunology for many years, I have to say, uh, with much skepticism from many, myself included. Um, you know, the advances in molecular biology, our abilities to do things, you know, with tumors to, you know, determine uh, genetics that, you know, at, at a rate and a pace and a cost that was previously unimaginable. Um, you know, all of these things have, have you know, developed in the uh, last few years, but really are a result of, of the decades of, of work before that. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at immunotherapy, probably one of our biggest areas of progress, you know, the roots of that are a century old. Um, so, you know, nothing's really new. It's just now we have the technology and the ability to really use it. And then I would also say that we've created the infrastructure that lets us test this. You know, the people who are, you know, have done the studies, you know, the endpoints for the studies, the expertise in doing clinical trials, you know, that also was, was there for decades. And, you know, we frequently were, you know, uh, um, kind of uh, ridiculed at times, oh, you're just testing this drug against that drug. But the reality is, is it was those incremental advances. It was the ability to know the endpoints, to refine the populations, um, to develop the infrastructure that allowed for all of this to happen. How is genetic testing changing the landscape? So genetic testing, and in this case, I mean the testing of the tumor, you know, not uh, germline, not the individual, um, is uh, been very, very crucial. Uh, you know, if you go back about 20 years ago, uh, it was, uh, there were a family of drugs called epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors or EGFR inhibitors. And the basic science at the time made it look like these would be best combined with chemotherapy and, and squamous uh, cell carcinoma. And as it turned out, combined with chemotherapy, they weren't very useful. Um, but as single agents, there were these occasional very dramatic results. So that came at a time when we were able to evaluate tumor DNA, sequence it uh, with some degree of ease and reasonable cost. And so there was the discovery of specific mutations uh, which were targeted by these drugs. So it was sort of interesting in that it was the clinical observation that led to the you know, discoveries in biology, not really the other way around. Um, but then that in turn resulted in 
looking for other mutations uh, which were found and uh, then the development of other drugs in some cases the repurposing of other drugs for those and now we have about half a dozen uh, very validated uh, targets uh, each one of which in a small slice of the population between say one in five ten percent of the uh, lung cancer population but um, uh, these, uh, if, if the patient has within their, within their cancer, uh, that particular mutation, these are drugs that are 80% plus uh, effective and frequently can be administered with relatively little toxicity and usually will give them benefit for, you know, one plus years or more. So, you know, that's been an example of uh, progress there. How does lung cancer generally present in people? What might someone notice? So, you know, when I teach my, you know, residents, you know, how do people show up, um, you know, which is, of course, very different for me. They usually show up with the diagnosis in hand. But um, for somebody who's a primary care physician, um, you know, what are you going to see? Well, you can see symptoms at the site of the origin of the disease in the lungs. So the pneumonia that doesn't go away, the cough that doesn't go away, um, the you know chest pain you know so that's one way that it can present. It can also present, unfortunately, all too frequently, advanced or metastatic disease, where the tumor uh, has spread to other organs in the body, uh, such as you know bone or brain, and so you may have a pain or fracture, seizure, a headache. You know those are all possibilities. Uh, and then sometimes the tumor uh, can secrete various uh, factors. Um, uh, we see this particularly in small cell lung cancer where uh, there are certain metabolic syndromes that can develop or neurologic syndromes as a result of uh, hormones or antibodies that the tumor uh, can secrete. These are called perineoplastic syndromes. Um, and then uh, tumors sometimes show up uh, and increasingly so now that screening has been validated and screening in lung cancer is every good if not superior to screening in breast cancer. Uh, there's a common myth that it doesn't work, but in fact, this has been now demonstrated in multiple randomized trials done in the United States and Europe uh, that clearly demonstrate uh, improved uh, outcomes uh, for uh, patients who are at risk who undergo screening exams uh, with low dose CT. And so increasingly we see those patients and then again, sometimes just incidental discoveries when somebody's getting a scan uh, for another reason. So those are all the ways that it can present. So it sounds like we're very good at getting people to doctors like yourself who can specialize in, in their disease once it's diagnosed. How are you approaching treatment decisions with your patients? Well, the treatment decisions uh, that uh, we make, um, you know, that I make are, you know, those that, you know, in ways similar to um, you know, other, you know, medical oncologists, and really depends because some of the patients may first go to a surgeon or, you know, whatever. I mean, however they come into the system, they, there are, you know, a few, you know, key factors in this. First is, um, you know, you make your decision based upon, number one, which kind of lung cancer. So there are two major varieties. You have small cell and non-small cell, and they're uh, treated, they're biologically distinct, and they're uh, treated in distinct ways. Um, and then the next major consideration is the stage of the tumor, which is our way of expressing how advanced that is and uh, deciding on, on both the therapy as well as conveying a prognosis and evaluating a patient for a clinical trial. And that's based upon the size and location of the tumor, the presence, absence, and location of lymph nodes, and the presence or absence and um, these days the number of uh, metastatic uh, areas of disease. So, and then lastly, and again, depending a little bit upon the stage and interacting with all the others is what condition is the patient in. Anybody can get lung cancer, but still the median is in uh, older individuals. Many of these patients have compromised uh, cardiac and pulmonary status, as well as other diseases of aging, hypertension, uh, cardiac disease, et cetera. Uh, and uh, those people, um, you know, one obviously has to tailor one's treatments uh, to uh, uh, fit those comorbidities. So that's sort of the, you know, how the basic assessment, obviously some patients show up with metastatic disease, you know that, but we go through a whole process uh, for this. 
you know, the staging system that we use is complicated and it keeps changing. Um, you know, we're, we're, gosh, up to version eight of this. Uh, I started with version three. Um, I'm not quite sure I fully mastered the current one. And the, the ninth edition is, is coming soon. Uh, so, uh, you know, and why does it keep changing? Because our knowledge of the disease keeps changing. The database keeps expanding. Um, we're able to be more refined. Um, uh, molecular variables have not yet fully entered into our considerations. Unquestionably, they will. Um, but basically, one could consider lung cancer, uh, despite the, you know, four major stages and multiple substages, that you really have three buckets that people will fit into. They have localized disease, which we will predominantly uh, address with a localized therapy, surgery, radiation, and many of those patients, however, uh, particularly those who might have a lymph node that's positive, uh, will benefit from chemotherapy to prevent recurrence. We have patients with locally advanced disease. Primarily, um, those are patients who have lymph nodes located in the middle of the chest as opposed to more localized disease where if there's a lymph node present, it's more uh, in the uh, lobe of the lung. Uh, those patients with lymph nodes in the middle of the chest or larger tumors are approached uh, with uh, uh, frequently a combination of chemotherapy, radiation, sometimes surgery. Uh, and then we have patients with advanced disease who will be predominantly uh, treated with uh, drug therapies, which nowadays, depending upon the molecular background of the tumor, could be a targeted treatment if they have a specific uh, mutation, something we see most frequently, though certainly not exclusively, uh, in patients with scant or no smoking history. Uh, they may be approached with uh, immunotherapy or chemotherapy combined with immunotherapy. And there are many considerations that go into those uh, decisions. And even in advanced stage, there may be, there are certainly roles for surgery and radiation, depending upon whether there are structural abnormalities, occasionally whether there are relatively few areas or sole areas of metastatic disease. And um, in the uh, localized and locally advanced disease, our goal is cure in those, though we certainly are uh, not there for every patient yet. And in advanced disease, it's extension of life, which is now quite considerable uh, compared to untreated disease. Uh, and I think uh, in certain situations, particularly those who only have a single area of metastatic disease, uh, curative treatment is a realistic possibility. And even those with more disseminated disease, we're now beginning to see a substantial a fraction of patients uh, who are still alive at uh, five years or more. And so we're beginning very cautiously to think that perhaps some of those patients may even be uh, cured of their disease, though not quite ready to say that. Well, it sounds though like there is a lot of reason to have hope if you are diagnosed with lung cancer, especially if it's diagnosed early. Of course, that would not stop a patient from worrying. So I hope uh, what we can do next is talk a little bit about some of the things we've heard patients say, and you can uh, yep. fact check us on that. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> this sounds like a real worrier. There are no new treatments in lung cancer. Well, there's nothing but new treatments in lung cancer. So I've been uh, involved in oncology. I think, uh, let's see, my fellowship was in the late 80s, you know, ended about 1990, so we're about you know, what is it, uh, not quite 30 years later, um, virtually every drug that I use was in development during my professional career, uh, just within the last few years. Uh, all the immunotherapeutic agents uh, were developed within the last, uh, say, 48 months, they were licensed. Uh, the targeted drugs are uh, all new within the last uh, 15 uh, years or so. so we're pretty much nothing but new drugs in lung cancer. As, and, and that's not just drugs, but also surgical techniques uh, have proceeded from uh, open thoracotomies uh, in almost all patients to uh, video assisted uh, thoracoscopic surgery, uh, which is uh, less morbid, gets the patient out of the hospital faster. Uh, in radiation, uh, radiation progressed from relatively low uh, uh, intensity radiation that was done where you drew it on an x-ray. I can still remember that uh, when I was a resident uh, to now, uh, you know, four-dimensional, you know, uh, assessments and the use of uh, uh, 
you know, uh, intensity modulated radiotherapy, uh, perhaps a role, maybe, maybe not for proton therapy in this situation. So uh, the use of stereotactic uh, body radiotherapy for treatment of uh, localized disease in patients who are medically unfit. Um, I, I think we're nothing but new therapies. Um, our supportive care is massively better uh, than it was 30 years ago. Um, you know, nausea and vomiting, you know, severe problems is largely a thing of the past. Um, you know, we have extremely effective anti-nausea agents. I may disappoint some people by telling you that marijuana is not one of them. Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, the fact is, is you know, many of those drugs were developed because the drugs 20 years ago, 30 years ago, were quite nausea uh, producing. Uh, and it was uh, heavily lung cancer folks, my, uh, you know, across the country, my colleagues, Dr. Skrala, Gandera, Einhorn, others, who were very involved in lung cancer, genetic urinary malignancies, gynecologic malignancies, where we're using what's termed highly emetogenic chemotherapy. We developed many of the anti-nausea drugs. We were extremely concerned about this. So our drugs are better. Uh, they're more active. They're less toxic. Uh, we have better supportive care. Uh, we have better integration with other uh, uh, modalities such as radiation and surgery. There are still many, many questions uh, with treatment, uh, many areas we can improve, many things we don't know, but uh, uh, it's nothing but new therapies. Yeah. yeah. Your history as a physician and, and noticing all this change will uh, likely help you advise patients who worry that their lung cancer diagnosis is a death sentence, which is something else that, that we hear from patients. So, you know, life is a death sentence. Um, you know, it's a little bit flippant, but, I, you know, I think that there are many, many bad diseases out there. Um, and uh, certainly there is no good lung cancer. And I don't want anybody to leave this and think, oh, you know, everything's rosy. It's not, you know, I, I though I do a lot of administration these days, I'm still in clinic, uh, see a fair number of patients. Um, and uh, the news is not always good. Not everybody responds, not everybody benefits, and that's why we still need to do the trials and advance what we're doing, um, both in terms of increasing the efficacy and decreasing side effects. Um, having said that, we have many, many patients who are living excellent productive lives, uh, you know, uh, able to see, you know, make life events, uh, anniversaries, birthdays, et cetera, uh, who would not have otherwise uh, been alive to do that. And, and as I said, there are an increasing fraction of, of cured patients, um, you know, where the disease is no longer at all uh, an issue. But, you know, it, it's one of those things we don't know until we try. Um, uh, and, um, you know, there are, there's no shortage of bad things that can happen to people. Lung cancer is one of them. Uh, I think what we do have are uh, increasing options for people that uh, truly meaningfully uh, improve their lives. Sure. Here's one I hadn't heard until just now. Surgery causes lung cancer to spread. <laughs> yeah, that's common in certain states. When I was in Maryland, that was a biggie. Um, so uh, there's a, a myth, uh, you know, that, you know, the air gets to the tumor and then it spreads. That, that's certainly not true. It certainly is possible that, you know, in a bad surgical procedure that, you know, disease can be spread. But I think what really historically what that was, was, you know, in the days before we had um, as accurate uh, radiographic studies. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I, I'm, as I said, I'm not that old. And I began medical school in before there were CAT scans. So the way you would diagnose something was with a, with a chest x-ray. Uh, that was, you know, your best chest imaging and the brain, you know, you'd image with something called a pneumoencephalogram, which is, you know, you don't know what that is. Most people don't, and they should be thankful for that. But we had no real way of knowing these things. So what would happen is there would be a surgical exploration. They would say, well, it looks very localized, but then you'd go in and there was lots of disease all over the place. And, you know, for the most part, that doesn't happen anymore. Now we have CT PET scans, we have MRIs, you know, um, patients before they go to surgery usually have had um, our, our pulmonary physicians will usually have sampled the nodes in the middle of the chest, the mediastinum. So, you know, it isn't that there aren't surprises, but there are far fewer. And certainly a properly done operation, you know, should not spread lung cancer. Uh, I would emphasize the properly done operation. Uh, it is my strong belief that the people, you know, nobody should have surgery 
for lung cancer from other than a board certified thoracic surgeon who spends their time thinking about lung cancer, preferably in an institution with a fair volume of this. You know, we know that, you know, I mean, it should be no surprise to people, practice makes perfect. You know, people who really focus in an area, you know, particularly at the NCI designated cancer centers, comprehensive cancer centers, who do a lot of this have greater expertise. Uh, how about this one? Treatment is not effective in older patients. Treatment's highly effective in older patients. Um, you know, it's interesting. So we had long arguments about, you know, when I started in this field, whether treatment ever worked. And there were a number of studies that showed that, you know, chemotherapy, that one platinum was better than, you know, platinum, what's called a platinum-based agent was better than no therapy. And then that two drugs were better than one drug. And uh, people would say, oh, well, that doesn't work in the elderly and they should only get one drug. And that's because I guess they're burning bush on the law and told them this. And, uh, you know, the fact is, is that then got evaluated in a uh, controlled trial, a very nicely done study by uh, my European colleagues. Uh, but what was crucial was that they used somewhat lower doses of chemotherapy, uh, a little bit different uh, schedule of chemotherapy. And it was clearly superior to a single agent. And now as we're, you know, even days before immunotherapeutics and these targeted agents. So, you know, many patients will benefit. You just have to be aware of certain basic principles in, you know, geriatric medicine, you know, and uh, as well as basic principles of lung cancer care. So, you know, first off, uh, if a patient is uh, elderly and but their tumor is characterized by a driver mutation, they get, you know, uh, a, uh, what, you know, one of the uh, uh, target, so-called targeted agents. Uh, uh, and these are, these days, very non-toxic, easy to take, and uh, highly effective. Um, patients, uh, you know, many are, are going to be eligible for immunotherapy, either as a single agent or combined with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy drugs can certainly be uh, cut in their doses and still preserve much activity um, and be done safely. You know, I had... Uh, a woman with small cell lung cancer, this is now about a, a year and a half ago or so, and she's in her 80s, and she came to me because she was told, oh, you know, just sort of get your affairs in order. And, um, you know, her disease was what we would term an extensive small cell staging system, it's a little bit different, but she didn't have a really vast bulk of disease. And, you know, uh, we treated her with uh, standard chemotherapy drugs, but at somewhat lower doses and some, you know, careful TLC and, you know, some other supportive things like growth factors. Uh, she got all of her treatment on an outpatient basis, had an excellent response. Uh, we used radiation um, uh, later to consolidate her treatment. And, you know, I see her back every couple of months. And, you know, I'm still, you know, I, I wouldn't say that she's necessarily cured of her disease, but she does yoga every day. She lives a full life. She sees her grandchildren. And she's, uh, I think, uh, I want to say 83, 84 years old. So, um, I think she's quite grateful for that. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's not the numerical age. Um, the flip side is if somebody's 50 years old and they're extremely ill uh, when they come in, um, then, you know, one has to be very cautious about what one does. It, we used to say that, you know, those patients who come in who are severely impaired uh, should not, should simply get supportive care and hospice services. Um, I actually, how would I put it, our lives have gotten a little bit more difficult lately because as, as things have gotten better for patients, because I can't necessarily say that as much because some patients are, may be very susceptible to the effects of, uh, other disease may be very susceptible to the effects of immunotherapy. Um, and I, I had one patient uh, who was a younger gentleman who was on a gurney, he was in his 50s, uh, lost an enormous amount of weight, he was on oxygen. Uh, we like immediately gave him fluids. My fellow, excellent fellow at the time came to me and said, should we uh, admit him and send him to hospice or just send him to hospice? And, you know, I looked and he had a, uh, a biomarker that indicated that he might have an excellent response to immunotherapy. So we gave him solely immunotherapy and saw him back a few days later. He was still pretty touch and go. We gave him some fluids week after that, you know, still we were, you know, kind of touch and go, but he was still with us. And then week after that, my medical assistant, uh, uh, Renee, comes in and she says, you know, he looks a little bit better today. And he was uh, in a wheelchair that day. And then a 
few weeks after that, he had a walker, and a few weeks after that, a cane, and about a year after that, was asking me about whether or not he could go on a cruise. And again, I still see this. So as this gentleman a couple of weeks ago, it's now almost two years later. And the question now that we have is, should we stop his treatment? Um, and he is restored to complete full health, has had almost no side effects of treatment. So, you know, again, this is not every patient. Uh, some people will be treated and get every side effect and no benefit. But uh, I think I've become, um, you know, a lot more reluctant to say that any patient should not at least uh, be offered the opportunity for treatment uh, uh, knowing what the potential side effects are. And there still are considerable and sometimes severe side effects from therapy. Yeah, yeah. And again, your, your experience and your long perspective on this disease can help you advise your patients thoughtfully. Uh, here's the last one that I have on my list here. Clinical trials are experimental and risky. Yeah, well, so is the rest of life. Um, so, you know, they're, they're generally you know, is there a risk? Yes. Essentially, every patient is always a trial because we, for the most part, you know, don't, you know, even even in the diseases, you know, the disease states where we have uh, very active treatments. So let's say, for example, we were talking about the EGFR mutation. So, so we have excellent drugs. So we have a drug now, osimertinib, outstanding drug, easy to take, low risk of side effects. Um, you know, the, the earlier generations, there was a lot of rash, diarrhea, that's been pretty much done away with. But on average, patients benefit from this drug for about a year and a half. So that's not great if you're 40 or 50 years old, you know, you want to do better. So what are our current studies where we're looking, you know, we're readdressing a question that we thought had been answered, but really it wasn't about, well, what's the value of chemotherapy plus this drug? What about the value of other drugs? So, you know, we can't promise anybody anything, but our current treatments are still not good enough. You know, there are certain diseases, let's say Hodgkin's disease, where you know you're going to cure almost all the patients up front or testicular cancer, et cetera, where, you know, again, but thanks to trials, clinical trials, uh, we now are at that stage. We're not there yet in lung cancer. And the reality is, is every patient should really be on a study. Um, you know, I think it's, and, and you know, we, we have this problem now in that our studies have also become far more complicated to enter people on because there are many more variables one has to look at. What's the molecular background of the tumor? How many prior therapies? You know, the condition of the patient, their organ function, et cetera. Um, and the regulatory burden has become much, much greater. But um, clinical patients on clinical trials, you know, let's look at the question. Um, are they risky? Well, everything is risky, and um, but we do a lot to manage that risk. Uh, patients who are on studies are observed more closely. We have to. It's the law. Uh, there's frequently additional personnel assigned, uh, number one. Number two, they're usually getting a standard of care plus a new treatment or a new treatment followed by the standard of care over, you know, some variation of that. Um, the... Um, uh, you know, they're given, you know, they're observed, like I said, very much, you know, more carefully than we would otherwise. Um, and so I think actually patients on trials uh, generally will do better. And we actually have evidence, um, you know, multiple individuals have looked at this, everything from first in man trials or early dose escalation studies, controlled studies that show that patients, even those on the control arms, generally do better uh, than similar types of patients uh, who are not treated on studies because we just are more careful. And the physician who participates in trials um, uh, is generally someone who has a greater knowledge of the disease. Sure. Uh, what do you notice from your patients? What do they tell you that you think needs to be debunked? Well, um, very similar to some of the questions that you've asked. I mean, you know, we address these issues all the time about, you know, is this, what's, is, is there hope with this? You know, how bad is it going to be, et cetera? Um, sometimes people think that inevitable diagnosis is going to have pain and misery, et cetera, or a lot of admissions. And, you know, we, I, I spent a lot of time, particularly in their uh, first visit, uh, addressing many of the, the questions that they may have. And, you know, again, there's, there's always this problematic balance with the disease, particularly in the advanced setting in particular, where, you know, one has to balance out what is, I think, an increasingly 
positive picture with the reality that still the vast majority of patients will ultimately die of their disease. But the question is, how long can we put that off? How can we improve quality and quantity of life, you know, even if one is going to ultimately die of the disease? So, you know, I, I think those are the things, you know, uh, there's this um, weird dichotomy that people have come to believe in that you're either, you know, you, you get treated and you're going to have always have symptoms or you'll, you'll, life will be pleasant and wonderful and you'll have this quiet, wonderful, peaceful right. you know, demise uh, if, if you're not treated. And it's really not true. I mean, the disease can be extremely uncomfortable, painful, distressing, et cetera. And treatment puts that off. Treatment prevents symptoms. Treatment improves quality of life. And it takes a little bit of time because that's how people are very socialized with this. You know, uh, not every drug causes hair loss. Not every drug results in nausea. You know, um, you know, th there's too much misinformation out there. Sure, sure. Treatment can uh, arrest the disease or slow down the progression of the disease, but it also has side effects. Let's talk a little bit about some of the concerns that patients have about the side effects. Let's see. Side effects are unavoidable. Well, that's not true. You know, as, as I said, you know, what, what were the side effects? If you go back uh, a couple decades, you know, and you ask patients what were they concerned about, many of them were concerned about nausea and vomiting. And that is largely a thing of the past. It, many patients will still have some queasiness with treatment, but even our most nausea producing drugs we really do have outstanding drugs for the prevention of that. Um, you, you have to use them, you have to take them, you know. Um, uh, it's very important to give them uh, appropriately. There are very excellent guidelines that are out there. Um, sometimes patients are still undertreated, no question about that. Um, not every drug um, has, uh, you know, industry strong backing. There's one drug, uh, uh, for example, that uh, olanzapine, uh, Zyprexa, which actually developed as an antipsychotic, and I always tell the patients, no, I don't think you're crazy, <laughs> you don't do, but you know, uh, but it's at a lower dose, and we have excellent, excellent evidence that that drug, given for a few evenings uh, after, you know, after chemotherapy is, is extraordinarily effective along with the other drugs in preventing nausea and vomiting, so that's one thing. Hair loss is uh, still somewhat inevitable with certain drugs, uh, the taxanes, but many of our regimens don't cause hair loss or, you know, as I tell folks, only the hairdresser, will, you know, you and your hairdresser will know for sure because it's hair on the pillow, but, you know, the average person won't pick you out of a crowd. Um, uh, those are big concerns still. Uh, there still are potentially life-threatening effects from, you know, chemotherapy, and we spend a lot of time educating people about that, but those are not inevitable. And, it's, it's actually a minority of patients in lung cancer. You know, one should not confuse, you know, there are different malignancies, you know, still the treatments for say, like acute leukemia, though even that's changing, can be extraordinarily toxic or the bone marrow transplant patients, many, and not just lung cancer, but in the other diseases as well, um, many of the things that people attribute to the drugs are more due to the disease, you know? And so I always say my, my greatest, failure and side effects of the drugs is they don't work well enough because the side effects of disease can be considerable. Um, so that's the, the bigger issue. The immunotherapeutic drugs have a rather um, interesting set of side effects. You know, they are clearly initially or frequently better tolerated than the old, uh, than the older cytotoxics, which still have an extremely valuable place in the treatment and cure of lung cancer. The immunotherapeutics have clearly been uh, quite beneficial, but their side effects can be subtle and far less predictable and can be very severe. I mean, virtually any organ in the body uh, can be affected by this. As you know, we like to say, if it ends in itis, you can get it from immunotherapeutics. So there's lots of, you know, side effects, no question, uh, but they can be managed. Um, you know, they can be prevented, they can be treated. Uh, sometimes we have to abandon a drug. So people who get severe, would call um, immunotherapy-related adverse events, uh, may not be able to uh, continue on their drugs. But even that uh, is not necessarily always the case. This next one really gets to the heart of the doctor-patient relationship. I shouldn't share my side effects with my healthcare team because I don't want them to stop my treatment regime. Well, you can't prevent the side effects if you don't know about them. And 
you know, I always would tell patients, I said, you know, if you're having a problem, please don't call me at four o'clock on Friday afternoon. I'm going to end up sending you to the emergency room, which I may anyway, but a lot of times we can solve certain things, you know, over the phone. There's a lot of side effects that can be treated, um, you know, and particularly if one is aware early on, um, you know, so yeah, you should share the side effects because how's somebody going to know how to deal with them? Now, the problem we run into sometimes is in a population with a lot of, you know, that's on average, you know, 60s and 70s, could be younger. Um, there's lots of things that can be just part of ordinary life. Uh, you know, everybody gets, you know, headaches, back pain, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have to treat those sometimes uh, much, you know, and evaluate them much more aggressively uh, because of the possibility of them being related to disease or drug. Um, but uh, it, it helps to sort it out. You, you can't be uh, too, um, you know, blasé about it because sometimes things need to be looked at very urgently, particularly with the immunotherapeutic drugs. Some of the side effects that can be severe can sometimes be very subtle in their onset. What else do patients talk to you about? What kind of things do they come in and, and talk about that may need to be debunked or that you need to correct? Well, uh, it's not contagious, it's not hereditary, you know, things like that. Um, you know, many people, um, you know, I'll ask always about asbestos and they'll say, well, I worked in this old building that had asbestos in it. Well, that doesn't count, you know, you, uh, particularly one of the, the rare, we're not really talking about it today, but mesothelioma, which is associated mm -hmm. with asbestos. Uh, you know, you gotta actually really be exposed, which means that, you know, somebody has to have torn into that. The latency is 30, 40 years, you know, so it's the, the pipe fitters, but actually the most common cancer associated with asbestos is non-small cell lung cancer. It's not mesothelioma. So, um, you know, there are lots of those sorts of things, but, you know, in general, the, many of the questions you've raised are, are quite common, common questions. As a patient, how can I differentiate between symptoms of lung cancer versus the effect of treatment? What should I be thinking about as a patient? It's not always easy. And, you know, again, that's why you got to discuss it. And, and it's not always easy for me to determine that because, you know, it's, it, it, there's, there's always several possibilities. It could be a side effect of treatment, it could be a side effect of disease, or it could be a side effect of people's comorbidities. And, you know, these frequently interact. So a patient, uh, you know, uh, anemia is a common problem where you have uh, low red blood cells. Well, we know that you get uh, anemia is from uh, disease, um, uh, you know, that causes a degree of what's called anemia of chronic disease. Uh, our drugs frequently can result in anemia, and then anemia can bring out other symptoms, can, you know, worse, you know, uh, patients who have uh, lung and cardiac heart dysfunction to start with uh, are going to have more problems. They may get angina. So there's you know, a lot of these things that interplay, and uh, it's, it's not always straightforward. Yeah. And Dr. Google can really get involved here. Yeah, that's always a problem. Yeah. Which brings us to our next section, myths about lung cancer in general. How about this one? All lung cancer is the same. Well, I, th I think by now one should be clear that it, not only is it not the same, but even what we used to term, you know, it's, it's like, you know, my life as a clinical investigator used to be a lot easier because we had non-small cell lung cancer at a particular stage. And now we have EGFR mutation. We'll have non-small cell lung cancer that occurs in people without a driver mutation. And then, well, do they have uh, uh, something called pdl one expression, which if it's high, uh, predicts for benefit from immunotherapy alone. And, you know, if not, then chemotherapy and immunotherapy is a good idea, is kind of the way to go in patients who are reasonable for that. We have uh, patients who may have an EGFR mutation, and then which kind of EGFR mutation? Uh, patients with ALK mutations, ROS, RET, um, CMET, um, you know, it goes on and on and on. And uh, all of these are different, and then there's small cell lung cancer, and then the stage of disease. Uh, and even within the stages, there's, there's all sorts of subtleties, you know, uh, in, in terms of the optimal treatment. So, it really is a team decision for many of these patients how to treat them. And uh, like I said, there's an increasing number of options um, and, and the answers are not always clear or perfect. Right, right. 
Uh, how about this one? Lung cancer only affects the lungs. Well, obviously, lung cancer can spread and kind of goes wherever it wants. There is uh, essentially no organ in the body. Um, I've had patients who refer to me as, uh, quote, lung cancer, uh, rather, who were initially showed up with a breast mass and were seen by breast cancer physicians. They would biopsy it, and it was clearly lung cancer that had metastasized to the breast. Lung cancer can go to the eye, can go to the brain, the skin, the adrenal glands, the liver. Uh, it, it's a disease that unfortunately likes to travel, metastasize in the body very early in its natural history. In other words, it's when you say early and late lung cancer, that's not necessarily a time. It's really low stage and high stage. Uh, uh, you can see a lung cancer that can be a rather small tumor in the lung uh, that may have already spread elsewhere in the body. Right, right, important. Uh, how about this one? Supplements will help with symptoms and side effects. Uh, not likely. Um, and more likely the other way around. So as I said, we have some very good ways of preventing things like nausea and vomiting. There's a lot of advice that is quite reasonable in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, dealing with side effects, staying well hydrated. Hydration means salt containing fluids, uh, chicken soup, of course, being just about perfect or Pedialyte, uh, uh, things like that are very good, but uh, exercise is extremely good. The problem with supplements is nobody really knows what's in those. Um, Many things can interact with uh, various drugs. Um, uh, you know, the, the term, you know, nutraceutical to me is nonsense. They're unregulated drugs. Um, and what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, many substances and many foods uh, metabolize through the liver or influence enzymes in the liver. Many of our drugs are processed through the liver. Uh, drugs can influence, so a drug that might inhibit the metabolism of a chemotherapy or uh, tyrosine, you know, or, or targeted drug will increase the body's exposure to that. That can increase the side effects. Or alternatively, it can accelerate the processing of the drug, which will decrease the efficacy. Uh, I've seen this on many occasions. You know, one should think, you know, the many of the, much of the populations on, you know, anti-cholesterol drugs, uh, cholesterol-lowering drugs called statins. Well, if you, I'm sure anyone who does it, you know, you you look at the bottle or you got the advice from the physician says, don't have it with grapefruit juice. So, you know, let's think about that. If grapefruit juice can substantially increase the side effects from a very commonly utilized drug like a statin, just think about what an unknown thing that you bought. And remember, everything you buy at these stores, that so-called supplement, you have no idea what's in it. Uh, there's no standards for these. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the FDA is not, not really uh, checking on those. I believe a few years ago, New York State Attorney General looked at this and found out a lot of these supplements were sawdust or weren't what they say they were. So I, I'm very, um, uh, I, I would strongly discourage the use of anything outside of what's actually a prescribed medication. If one wants to use an alternative therapy like yoga, massage, you know, image therapy, you know, and again, exercise, things that we know really work with people, absolutely do that. Uh, but I would discourage, um, you know, these herbal medications, supplements, et cetera. Uh, or if you insist upon it, definitely tell your physician, uh, because then when they're dealing with the side effects, it helps them to figure out what it was. Yeah, yeah, discussing what you're taking or what you would hope to take with your physician and your care team is probably paramount. Let's talk a little bit about health literacy. What would you suggest patients use for online resources? What's, what are good resources? So there are some excellent resources. The International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer has resources for patients. The National um, uh, Coalition of uh, 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 Comprehensive uh, Cancer Center uh, uh, Network, NCCN, has uh, uh, resources. The American Society of Clinical Oncology uh, has resources. So, um, you know, those are really American Cancer Society. So there are some really reliable uh, sources out there. And then there's a great deal that's very unreliable. You know, people's Facebook pages, you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, you know I've seen this. You know, you know, we had, uh, you know, everybody always, and I think it's important for people to understand there will be people who will get something and have a fantastic response. You know, I've, I've used anecdotes. The anecdotes I've used are to illustrate 
the potential benefit. They're not exceptions to the rule anymore. They're the you know good case scenarios. I could have just as many anecdotes of people who didn't benefit, you know, and stuff. And I think it's important going into this, and that's why we're reassessing patients constantly and getting repeat scans because we don't necessarily know always, you know, even if something's 90% effective, it means 10% of the time it's not. Um, so, you know, and each patient, you know, we're, we're getting better at individualizing, personalizing therapy, but we're not perfect yet. And uh, we probably never will be. Um, so there will always be anecdotes. I think what's, um, you know, as a friend of mine puts it, the plural of anecdotes uh, is not data. When I say, well, chemoimmunotherapy works, it's not because I have anecdotes of that, though anecdotes ex illustrate the magnitude of benefit. I have data that shows that the chemoimmunotherapy regimen was compared to chemotherapy and was clearly and unequivocally superior. When I give a statistic that, you know, 60% of patients, 65% can benefit from that, those types of regimens, that's based upon prospective randomized controlled trials. Uh, Dr. Edelman, as a researcher in the field, tell us why you're hopeful about lung cancer research. Well, I think that, um, you know, we have gone from trials with very small incremental improvements and frequently, uh, you, know, um, you know, very slow degree of progress where, you know, if we had a positive study every two or three years, we were thrilled to the point where we've had an avalanche of positive studies. I don't think my younger colleagues know what a negative trial looks like anymore. Uh, even our negative trials are pretty impressive. You know, we've had studies where an immunotherapy agent was compared with chemotherapy and it was designed to show that the drug would be better and it was just as good and that was in a negative study and that's the correct interpretation. But still, I would point out that, you know, that's, that's quite remarkable because these other drugs had been taking us 25, 30 years to develop, you know, and now you have another drug with a very different mechanism of action that's as good, uh, potentially, that's, that's impressive. Uh, I think we've just had an amazing degree of progress in the last few years. Uh, we have far more drugs. We understand far more about the disease, the technology at every point from diagnosis to assessment of response to the ability to evaluate better what we're not doing well. So our studies now frequently have biopsies before, during, and after treatment in a way of trying to figure out why is stuff working or not working. I mean, it, back in 2006 or so, I proposed a study. Uh, we ended up doing it, but it took two or three years because we were acquiring a piece of, you know, a biopsy result, not actually not even a new biopsy, but just an archived specimen from the original biopsy to determine eligibility. And there was strong pushback that we would never be able to do that. And now we routinely are getting biopsies and rebiopsying. And that's over a brief period of time. And, and so we're getting to get better understanding of the disease and why stuff works and doesn't work. Um, and I think that that's why uh, progress will accelerate. And I would, again, emphasize progress only happens, real progress only through clinical trials. You know, we've cured a lot of mice for many decades. Uh, mouse is not a person. Um, you know, you actually have to do the studies uh, patient by patient. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we are making uh, substantial progress. Uh, we almost have too many things to test right now. That's a good problem to have. <laughs> Dr. Edelman, thanks so much for taking the time today. You're welcome. My pleasure. And thank you to all of our partners. To learn more about lung cancer and to access tools to help you become a proactive patient, visit PowerfulPatients.org. That's PowerfulPatients with an S.org. I'm Patricia Murphy, your host. Thanks. Mm -hmm.